So thank you again. Uh, the webinar series uh, that we are uh, doing here is conducted by uh, in collaboration between the University of Minnesota, the Duluth uh, Global uh, Health Research Institute, and the Africa and Middle East Congress on Addiction, uh, America. I'm uh, Mustafa Lapsi. I'm a professor at the University of Minnesota Medical School. And uh, co-presenting uh, with me today is Dr. Arwa Bensala, an assistant professor at the University of uh, Monastir uh, Medical School in, in Tunisia. So uh, when COVID hit the world in the spring of uh, 2020, more than a year now, we were asked to basically stop everything and the lockdown started and then we knew that we were experiencing a major life-threatening event and stressor. We launched a global study to track down and to track how people uh, were experiencing this upheaval and how they were coping with these changes. So the focus uh, of the webinar today is to highlight results from this early survey. The webinar will start by an introduction of the study uh, and general results that I'll present. Then I will uh, turn the floor to Dr. Ben Saleh, who will present some interesting results related to the role of resilience in moderating the relationship and the connection between uh, social isolation experience during COVID and, uh, and sleep. The, uh, she already published actually the first paper from uh, this data set. Uh, we will have that link to the paper in the chat window uh, today, hopefully. And uh, if not, then we'll circulate it to people. Uh, so uh, I'd like you to feel comfortable to provide comments uh, through the chat window and uh, questions uh, through the question and answer window. Uh, you, you'll see that in the bottom of uh, your screen. Before I start, I'd like to just uh, uh, put some disclosures. We have no financial conflicts of interest to declare. Our uh, research program is uh, funded primarily by NIDA, uh, NIH, with some seed funding from the University of Minnesota. Uh, so I'd like to uh, first uh, acknowledge uh, the people that helped us with this study. Um, the team that helped from the University of Minnesota, uh, but also the many other colleagues from around the world who provided input and uh, facilitated uh, recruitment uh, of the study uh, uh, during the early launch of this, uh, of this uh, study. Okay, so we all know that COVID-19 has pr produced a shock to the world, leading to all types of disruption in normal lives. The world was not prepared for this uh, amount of chaos that we had to experience. Um, the impact of the pandemic uh, has been devastating globally. So for more than, more than 2.8 million already lost their lives, uh, more than 127 million uh, cases were documented, infection, infectious uh, cases, and a huge social and economic uh, and personal uh, uh, consequences have occurred over this last uh, year plus. The impact of our life is, is going to be felt for years and possibly decades to come. Uh, this impact would be manifested by ongoing and delayed costs on many uh, facets of our lives. And um, uh, for sure, there will be a delayed impact on our mental well being and our and various other behavioral and cognitive uh, issues uh, that we are going to have to endure as we recover from this, to endure as we recover from this. Uh, from this pandemic. So in March uh, of 2020, we started the lockdown 
And our team worked virtually to launch this global survey. Initially, it was in English. Uh, the goal was to capture the ongoing psychosocial, economic, and health challenges that people were experiencing as they were starting to adjust to this pandemic and uh, all the major changes that came with it. Uh, we also translated the survey to eight other languages, including all UN official languages. Uh, we used multiple approaches to, uh, to recruit, and we uh, 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 utilized our network of social colleagues and professional organizations, as well as uh, using uh, we use social media uh, when, when we could. The uh, initial study uh, included a set of variables. We examined stress, uh, uncertainty, depression, and uh, other psychological symptoms associated with, with COVID-19 and the adjustment and, uh, uh, that was going on trying to cope with, with those changes. Uh, we also assessed substance use and misuse. Uh, we focused in this initial stage uh, of our work on alcohol, uh, tobacco, uh, and cannabis before and, and during the, the pandemic. Uh, we also assessed sleep and other health-related behaviors, and we used a, a, a task called delay discounting to measure impulsivity and decision-making. Uh, the survey also included questions about attitude, perceptions, media consumption, and other behaviors related to the pandemic. Uh, finally, uh, factors that contribute to promoting resilience and effective coping uh, were included. So based on previous research, we chose factors that are related to stress and also have been identified to increase or decrease risk for respiratory illnesses after virus exposure. So factors that, that increase uh, risk include uh, things like smoking, uh, chronic psychological stress, uh, poor sleep, uh, and social isolation. Uh, factors that decrease risk for respiratory illness after virus exposure uh, include social integration, social support, physical activity, uh, and good sleep. So we targeted some of, this, some of these measures in our survey. Uh, last summer, by the way, we, we did circulate a detailed report of the initial phase of our analysis. Uh, the report has, has more information on the methods, uh, the recruitment, the recruited sample, and the results uh, in general. For now, I should just mention that that the sample we had for this initial phase of the survey in the spring of 2020 was uh, 5,123 participants with a completed survey. Uh, the sample uh, included both men and women, and the, the criteria for enrollment was primarily being an adult 18 year or older. Uh, the, study, the study was uh, approved by the University of Minnesota Institutional Review Board or Ethical Committee. The graphs here show the age distribution of men and women in the study. As you can see, most of the respondents were young and middle age. Uh, and uh, we had more women uh, than men in the sample. So I will next share with you some highlight of some of the findings. I won't share everything. Uh, just a small fraction to give you an impression. We will see the results from the US sample uh, to the right and from the whole global sample to the left. And we include the baseline numbers, uh, which are related to the status of these measures before the pandemic. These are the uh, column in blue. And the changes during the pandemic, uh, these are in red. Uh, the pandemic numbers are always going to be in red. Uh, we also uh, will be looking at the shift in the numbers from the left horizontally to the right. So as you can see from uh, 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 not at all to a lot. 
so this slide includes data on depression. We see that more of our participants reported feeling uh, depression, uh, some of some some to a lot of the time during the pandemic compared with uh, before the pandemic. Uh, this applies to some degree to both the US uh, population and the uh, global uh, population. Uh, you will see the number of those reporting significant amount of depression uh, double to triple uh, during the pandemic. This is consistent with uh, subsequent national reports indicating the escalation of depression, uh, depressive symptoms during this period. Uh, we see this shift for increased report of an anxiety. The shift distribution is clear toward having, uh, having more anxiety during the pandemic. Again, uh, there are uh, these are the red lines that you will see. You'll notice the increase in the numbers uh, uh, shifting toward greater number. More more of our participants reporting have experiencing a lot of anxiety. Uh, during uh, during the the um, the pandemic, and this uh, note of uh, indicating now this reflects to reflects the time when these data were collected. So not currently, but now as if in last spring of 2020. Uh, with the reported feeling of uh, social isolation, uh, people experienced more, as we would expect, uh, feeling socially isolated during the COVID uh, period uh, than before uh, the pandemic. Um, we see the same shift with reports of general stress and being overwhelmed in, the, in both the U.S. sample and the global sample. Uh, greater numbers of our participants reported being overwhelmed by stress during compared with uh, before uh, COVID-19. Uh, Another highly relevant construct to the, stat to the situation was uncertainty. We asked people about their feeling of uncertainty about various issues in their lives, including work, uh, finance, uh, health, and about the future. As expected, you see the, here are some examples of, of those reports. Uh, there is significant increases in the level of uncertainty. And this was excuse me, consistent across all the assessed domain of life here. Again, the picture is consistent between the US and the global sample. As mentioned earlier, we also assist substance use changes from before to during the pandemic. We uh, focus on tobacco use, cannabis use, and alcohol use. We are expanding these measures in our longitudinal version of the study to include opioids and other substances. Um, so uh, what we generally saw was an increase of use of uh, of all nicotine products, what you see on, on this uh, slide. Uh, note uh, numbers uh, in red are portions of those who reported use rather than the total sample, uh, rather than from the total sample of the study. So uh, more than a fifth of those who uh, used nicotine reported escalation or increase in their nicotine use during uh, the pandemic. Uh, we also the, this, uh, as, saw this escalation uh, during uh, COVID for alcohol. Uh, this was evident both in the US as well as globally. Uh, about a fifth again from of those who use alcohol reported significant increases in their alcohol consumption during the pandemic. 
Uh, the same pattern holds for cannabis use, uh, except here we see the escalation even greater, reaching 30% uh, who, uh, who reported using more than uh, before. Uh, in addition, uh, among those reported regular use, we uh, find, again, a third uh, reported uh, um, increase a little bit more than the, those numbers. I'm, I'm talking about the people that reported regular, like in daily or weekly use, those uh, individuals uh, escalated their cannabis use even more so during uh, the uh, COVID uh, period, uh, COVID uh, uh, survey period, more than 33%. Uh, the number here shows all users versus the ones that reported daily users where we saw even greater escalation there. In a series of regression analysis, we found that experiencing increase in increases in negative mood during the pandemic, like depression and anxiety and certainty, social isolation, predicted increase in nicotine uh, use. Uh, we found similar pattern with the, with the uh, alcohol use, uh, basically people experiencing increases in negative mood, predicted increase uh, uh, were uh, 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 consuming uh, more uh, uh, alcohol uh, and the escalation uh, uh, led to greater, uh, greater uh, consumption. Uh, on the other hand, notice in red that people who reported greater social support uh, during the pandemic, uh, uh, that was negatively associated uh, with in, with the, with the alcohol use. So greater social support, less alcohol use. Uh, beyond this data, there are other national epidemiological data supporting escalation of substance use disorder during the pandemic. Uh, for example, we know that alcohol sales have risen by more than twenty five percent. Uh, in an analysis of about 500,000 urine uh, drug tests uh, conducted in a national laboratory survey, this is the Millennium Health uh, Laboratory, they showed uh, an increase uh, of about 32% uh, in non-prescribed fentanyl use, 20% of methylphenidate, 10% of cocaine, and there was 18% increase in drug overdose that was reported uh, by a national sample in a national lab in, lab in Baltimore. So be aware that these numbers have changed further uh, in recent months and uh, as the world continued to battle and, 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 uh, and experience and cope through those uh, different uh, um, waves of, of uh, the virus. We should point out here uh, that COVID was also more prevalent among people with substance use disorder. Indeed, in a case control study that included electronic health records uh, of uh, about 70 million uh, patients, of whom uh, more than 12,000 had a diagnosis of COVID, uh, the risk of COVID was much higher in those with, uh, with substance use disorder. Note the multiple odd ratio for, for infection across all substances, all substances here. And then you have alcohol, a cannab uh, cocaine, cannabis, opioid, and, and tobacco. And notice with, with, can with the opioid, you have about 10 times odd ratio of having uh, COVID uh, um, versus control. And in that same study uh, by Wang et al. that was published recent, uh, re uh, recent in recent months, uh, uh, late last year actually, uh, the study found that death rates of COVID patients was higher in those with substance use disorders, especially among African Americans. So why? Uh, why? We 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 know our research and studies by others have demonstrated increased drug use during societal changes like economic uh, downturns and other major societal stress. Uh, when these change, when, when, when these uh, things happen, these major things happen like living through a pandemic, 
you start seeing what we observed in our survey, deterioration of mood and uh, deterioration of uh, uh, mental health condition, increased sim uh, uh, psychological symptoms, increased stress and uh, uncertainty, increased social isolation. Uh, for a substance use disorder, there, is, there was a reduction of treatment uh, seeking uh, activities or people not seeking out uh, treatment for uh, fear of con contracting uh, COVID. Uh, these factors lead directly and indirectly to the escalation of substance use and its harmful effect. The, the situation is also compounded by uh, uh, limited access to services or closed services in some, uh, in, in, in some areas for uh, people uh, with substance use disorders. So what's to do about it? Uh, multiple factors can help us manage uh, this uh, stress and uh, promote uh, resilience. Uh, next, uh, we hear from Dr. Arwa bin Saleh about some hints as to what uh, can help us cope. So it is my honor to introduce uh, to you all Dr. Arwa to give, our, uh, give us uh, her uh, presentation. So Dr. Arwa, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mustafa. Hello, everyone, and welcome uh, uh, to this uh, webinar. Uh, so let me first uh, share, my, share my screen and my presentation. Uh, so as uh, Dr. Mustafa said, I will talk today about um, an important factor, which is resilience, a factor uh, that has a role in buffering the effects of social isolation on mental health and sleep during COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, so in this context of COVID-19 pandemic, this global health crisis, um, and in the absence of um, the treatment specifically approved uh, for this disease, and in the absence of a global access uh, to, to the vaccine, non-pharmaceutical interventions remain uh, pa the pillars of infection prevention. Uh, so among these uh, measures, we have stay at home, quarantine, lockdowns, and reduced uh, social interactions. So um, all of them, unfortunately, may lead to elevated levels of loneliness and social isolation which in turn may impact our physical and mental well-being. Um, so um, and this has been reported in, in many previous studies linking the social isolation to depression and anxiety, and also supported by um, other studies conducted during COVID-19 pandemic and showing uh, increases in anxiety, depression, and stress level compared to before the pandemic. And Dr. Mustafa uh, talked about this. And so all these um, negative, uh, negative psychological states uh, can have several consequences and can negatively affect sleep and sleep quality, and which in turn may affect uh, immune function. So, um, and this uh, due to the important role uh, of sleep in strengthening immune uh, system. So in fact, it has been demonstrated in many studies uh, that a good sleep quality um, allow, allows for a balanced and effective immune function and promote host defense. So this relationship between uh, this relationship between sleep quality and immune function makes it important here to um, understand and identify um, factors that may affect our sleep quality, especially during infectious diseases outbreaks, such as here during a COVID-19 pandemic. And um, as and based on what I uh, mentioned it, on this relationship between sleep quality, depression, anxiety, and social isolation, um, uh, these, these two factors, social isolation and depression, anxiety, or mental health, uh, are among, uh, factor, among these factors that can affect sleep. And we propose it here to examine this relationship. So the, the relationship between sleep quality, 
perceived social isolation, uh, depression, and anxious mood during uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And this was our uh, first objective or the first objective of this study. Uh, we also aim to test the mediating role of depressed and anxious mood in the relationship between social isolation and sleep quality. So here we predicted that uh, social isolation affects sleep quality through affecting the mood and through increasing depression and anxiety symptoms. In other words, we can say here that social isolation may lead to more depression and more anxiety that in turn may affect uh, sleep quality and leads to an impaired sleep. Resilience is another important factor that might affect sleep quality and may, enter, and may intervene here. So uh, resilience or the ability to bounce back or to recover uh, from stress may buffer the impact of the pandemic-related uh, social isolation on negative mood and sleep. So here we predicted that individuals with, um, who are resilient may be less likely to experience depression and anxiety, as well as impaired sleep uh, resulting from a social isolation and loneliness and loneliness. So uh, our third objective was to investigate uh, this moderating role or this protective role of uh, psychological resilience in uh, the mediation or in the relationship between social isolation, depression, anxiety, and sleep quality. So for that, uh, we conducted this global survey between uh, March 31st and uh, May 15th, 2020. So here during an early stage of the pandemic, uh, participants uh, were qualified for the study if they were 18 years of, old, of age or older. And um, you can find more details about uh, the methodology here in the report of the survey, which is available online and or in the paper. And we will uh, share with you uh, this, the links. Uh, so I will talk here about uh, some measures or the measure of the variable that we used in this analysis. And so in addition to sociodemographic features, um, we collected data on perceived social isolation. So here um, participants reported uh, to what extent they have felt socially isolated in the time since the beginning of the pandemic. Also, we collected data about depressed and anxious mood and for this, um, we used the PHQ-4 or the four item patient health questionnaire. Resilience uh, was assessed using the brief resilience scale and for perceived sleep quality respondents uh, were asked about their average sleep quality or the perceived restfulness uh, during the pandemic and also before the pandemic. So from uh, this, we estimated and quantified the change in sleep quality uh, during and before the pandemic. So mediation and moderated mediation uh, models were tested uh, using Hayes process macro for SPSS. And we used, um, so these two models for mediation, uh, this model for mediation and with uh, social or perceived social isolation as uh, our uh, independent variable, Depress, depression, and, uh, depression and anxiety as our mediator and a perceived change in perceived sleep quality as our dependent variable. So for the second model, which is for mod moderated mediation, we added uh, resilience uh, the, as a moderator to be tested. Uh, we, had, we have here also um, some graphs for some diagram for uh, statistic. Uh, so for those who want uh, to know more about uh, statistics, models, equations used, uh, so they can refer back to the, the paper. Um, so our final sample of respondents in this analysis was 3,816 individuals uh, from uh, 94 different countries, and most of them were from US, um, followed by respondents from Germany, India, and Tunisia. The mean age was about 38 uh, years. Uh, most of respondents were um, female, and about uh, half of them were married. Uh, 
So more than 80% of participants had a high educational level and about 68 were employed either full or part-time. So now about the perceived social isolation, we had more than 80% of participants were feeling socially isolated with different degree, so from slightly to a lot. For depression and anxiety, we can see here that about one third of participants had no symptoms, about one third had mild symptoms, and about one third had moderate to severe symptoms of depression and anxiety. About resilience level, so and based on the questionnaire classification, uh, about 61% of participants had normal level of resilience, about 12% had high level of resilience, and about 27 had low level of resilience. Perceived sleep quality before the pandemic and during the pandemic are represented here. And you can see, and uh, you can see here that there is uh, there was a deterioration of sleep quality. So the number of individuals with poor sleep increased, and the number of individuals with good sleep quality decreased. Also, uh, even we have here the scores of uh, perceived sleep quality. So the the mean uh, score decreased before for the during uh, the pandemic, and we have a significant uh, decrease in the score, and we had a negative uh, change score. So um, we can see here that um, overall sleep was perceived as less stressful since the beginning of the pandemic. So this negative change in perceived sleep quality, or let's say this poorer sleep quality was positively correlated with perceived social isolation and depression and anxiety. So in other words, the more we are socially isolated or the more we perceive that, the more our sleep quality decrease and the more we have a poorer sleep quality. The same thing, the more we have um, depression and anxiety symptoms, the more our sleep quality decreased uh, during the pandemic. Uh, for resilience, so resilience was also associated with sleep quality, but here it was negatively correlated to poorer sleep quality. So persons with higher resilience uh, scores had less decrease in their sleep quality and had uh, less poorer sleep quality. Resilience was also negatively uh, correlated to depression and anxiety and persons with uh, higher uh, scores of resilience or higher levels of resilience had less symptoms of depression and anxiety during the pandemic. Our uh, hypothesis about the mediating role of depression and anxiety and the relationship between social isolation and sleep quality was reported by this data. And we found that social isolation uh, affected sleep quality through depressed and anxious mood. So uh, we can say here that social isolation leads to more depression and anxiety that in turn affects our sleep quality and leads to an impaired sleep quality. So this indirect effect, which is the effect of social isolation on sleep quality through depression is in addition to the direct effect, which is uh, illustrated here. And as we can see here, the indirect effect is more important. So it is three times more important than the direct effect. Consistent with our prediction about the moderating role of resilience, we found that the impact of social isolation on mood and on sleep quality decreased. Uh, so we found that the impact of social isolation on mood and on sleep quality decreased as the level of resilience increased. So this effect was stronger among individuals with low levels of resilience. 
decreased as the resilience increased and was weak among individuals with high level of resilience. Uh, so we can conclude here, uh, and thanks to this study, which is the first to examine the role of resilience uh, in buffering the, the, the effect or the impact of the pandemic related perceived social isolation on mood and on sleep. So we can conclude that individuals with high levels of psychological resilience are at less at uh, less at risk of experiencing uh, these negative outcomes. So these findings suggest that interventions focusing on improving and promoting resilience and social isolation may help to reduce uh, the harmful mental and physical health consequences of feeling socially isolated. And there are multiple malleable factors that can contribute to enhancing resilience, uh, such as staying socially connected and engaging directly or via other means of communication, uh, integrating healthy habits to your daily routine, including physical activities, uh, staying close to nature when and when uh, possible, and working cognitively through challenges. Uh, so you are going through by moving beyond the past and thinking, uh, of the present and of the future. So also um, another important factor, which is sleep. So sleep, which is critical for good uh, mental and physical health and for promoting uh, resilience. So it's important here to pay attention to our sleep hygiene. Indeed, improving sleep quality is a uniquely malleable method that can, can improve resilience and can improve mental health. So uh, finally here, uh, we can say that this pandemic has forced the whole world to live through a common experience and appreciate the importance of making uh, changes in lifestyles, the sense uh, of we are in it together. And we had to adapt to telecommuting, remote work, Zooming, online learning, and making the best of staying at home. So all in all, this pandemic has shown us many aspects of human resilience. And we should, we should learn from this collective experience. And thank you. Thank you, Dr. Arwa, for an interesting uh, presentation. Uh, so uh, I have a few comments here on the chat room and a couple of questions. Uh, please feel free for those of you who have any questions or comments to post them either in the question and answer or the chat window. Uh, I should mention before I, we get into that, uh, that uh, we're continually collecting uh, uh, data and currently actually we have a more in-depth longitudinal study to trying to track changes in symptoms, uh, looking at uh, uh, potential uh, um, traumatic uh, uh, and uh, and uh, post-traumatic uh, stress issues experienced by uh, those who uh, were or have been severely uh, impacted or been ill or hospitalized, and uh, as well as those who are just have, have had to endure this much uh, during this uh, this year. And we're continually collecting. We are uh, currently, and, and actually we plan to continue to analyze the various data sets. Um, moreover, we are, we're actually happy to collaborate with anyone interested in having access to any of our data sets. And uh, uh, we'll, we'll be happy just to work to help you through the process of how you could do that. Um, uh, there was a question about access to the journal. I did post the link to art, the article that that uh, 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 includes uh, the initial uh, analysis that Dr. Arwa and uh, uh, and uh, uh, our colleague uh, Brianna DeAngelis worked on and uh, published uh, uh, last month. Uh, there was a question about um, if your group conducted, if, our, if the group conducted analysis comparing different countries, 
or different languages. Uh, what do you think, Dr. Arwa? Do you uh, think, yeah, you started uh, already looking at some of that. Do you answer that? Uh, thank you, Dr. Abs. So we didn't compare all uh, countries because, because you have, we have uh, more than uh, 90 uh, countries, but we started uh, looking at and anal analyzing uh, some data by region, for example, the North uh, African region or the East Mediterranean region. Yeah. Uh, so, so that's that's something to be to be pursued in future. Uh, in future analysis. Um, I see a few more questions here. Um, uh, can review the effects of social support and social. I was, no, I was clear on the direction of effects. Thanks, great study. Okay, Dr. Andrews, good, good comment. Appreciate it. Um, uh, the the question about the urban versus rural collection um, of the data. Uh, we have uh, actually a substantial portion of the uh, of the collected data from from uh, rural communities. Uh, but there were multiple classifications. Do you recall this, uh, Dr. Aro? I think you uh, about yeah. the rural. For, for the yeah, for the classification we used, so um, I think population of more than uh, 50,000, uh, so uh, as rural, uh, between uh, 2,500 and uh, 5,000 uh, for uh, ur uh, urban cluster, and less than uh, 2,500 for rural. Yeah, so I think, so we had multi different clustering of rurality, I guess, or urbanization or urban sites. And uh, I, I don't recall from the data if, if, I think the majority came from rural, from urban communities, urban, however, yeah. that varied between countries. I think in the US, we had more rural, representation than we saw in other countries. I don't know, but this is something that's certainly worth pursuing into, uh, into the future. Uh, as to the data, yes, we are more than happy to share with anybody any of the data. All we, you need to do is just reach out to one of us and uh, we'll get you started with the process of how you can get access to the data. We would want to make sure that uh, we're clear so that we don't have overlapping efforts. We don't want to have multiple people working on the same question, for example. And we have already multiple data sets, especially with the longitudinal data uh, waves coming through. Can, can you comment with the delayed gratification results? Thank you very much. Yes, that's a good point. We did, uh, we did collect uh, the delayed discount, uh, delay, uh, uh, delayed discounting uh, task, and uh, we have already analyzed some of that data, and the, uh, there are some very interesting uh, but complex interaction that I don't think we'll have the time to entangle uh, right now. But we are working on that and developing a write-up from that. Uh, I can tell you, in the subsequent waves and the longitudinal study. We have a little bit more elaborate uh, uh, testing of that construct, the delayed uh, uh, discounting and impulsivity and other cognitive processes uh, that are computer-based, and we use the remote uh, access to that to uh, facilitate acquiring more data to address that question. So uh, we hope to share uh, with you these data uh, uh, in, in coming uh, months. Uh, otherwise, thank you so very much for your time, for attending, and uh, we look forward to connecting with you more in the future. We'll, we have this uh, uh, webinar every month. So uh, thank you again, and uh, stay well, and uh, uh, until next time. Thank you.